morning, everyone. Um, I see participants are still arriving, but I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Maria Keeney, and on behalf of the Smurfit Executive Development, I'd like to welcome you here to this webinar this morning. We are delighted to have our colleague Stephen Boyle um, uh, here with us today, who will discuss improved decision making for executives and organizations. As many of you may know, Stephen is Program Director to our very popular winning negotiation strategies, as well as, of course, our Diploma in Advanced Management Performance. He's an experienced trainer and consultant specialising in the field of decision making, negotiation, influence, persuasion and, and communication skills. He has 20 years experience in management consulting, corporate communications, strategic planning and change management. Stephen also lectures on the MBA, MSc programs, and of course, our open and executive, uh, our open and customized programs at executive development. He has delivered negotiation skills training in Southeast Asia, the USA, as well as in Europe. His clients range from sectors such uh, as diverse as bio, pharma, construction, automotive, and law enforcement. He's also a consultant on management development programs for the United Nations uh, International Trade Centre in Geneva. Uh, lastly, just before I hand you over to Stephen, uh, we would like to invite you to ask any questions that you might have in the chat session uh, setting at the bottom of your screen. So um, without further ado, I will hand you over to Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Maria. Hello, everyone. I'm glad you've come along to this session. Uh, obviously, you're interested in learning how to improve your decision making, uh, which is just as well, because although I don't know most of you personally, I do know that you're not good at decision making. You don't take enough care when you make decisions, basically. Um, this isn't a personal comment about you. I'm not passing judgment. It's simply because, like all of us, your brain has two modes of thinking which have become labeled by psychologists and decision experts as system one and system two. Now, system one is a highly efficient, intuitive autopilot mode in which your choices, if they can even be called that, are actually made by feelings, habits, and a whole bunch of rules of thumb without any real reflection. System two, is what we might think of as making a decision. It's a reflective considered mode in which you make choices, you make decisions through an effortful, deliberate process. You use this occasionally, but actually quite rarely. So for example, if you had to fill out uh, a very important application form or tax processing form that you've never filled out before, you'd have to engage in system two thinking. If you were learning another language and you were trying to memorize and conjugate verbs in different tenses, you'd be using system two thinking. But almost all the time, including when you're doing almost every aspect of your job, you're using this automatic, intuitive system one approach to thinking. When you're doing that, your decisions are riddled with cognitive biases and you're barely aware of it. I mentioned that in the way we think, we tend to use a whole load of rules of thumb in our judgment, in our decisions. These are known as heuristics, heuristics. And they're system one's way of cutting down on the effort that's required to make choices. But the problem is they're riddled with cognitive biases. I'm sure you have heard of cognitive biases, by the way, and I'll come to that. Um, so for example, one of these well-known heuristics is called the status quo heuristic whereby we have a strong preference for sticking with any present default situation or choice, say, for example, in company strategy. That can combine and snowball with other cognitive flaws. Uh, like, for example, we have a tendency to take more risks when we perceive ourselves to be in a situation that's loss-making than when we're in a situation that's positive or gain-making. And so that combines with the status quo trap to lead to something called the escalation effect, whereby we become more and more reluctant to change a strategy that's failing than a strategy that's moderately successful. And we have loads and loads of examples of this in the business world. For example, Kodak, 
consistently refused to lead the way into digital photography, even though at an early stage they had an opportunity to do so. More recently, HMV, the music sellers, failed to enter the digital music market until 2010, just about three years before their final demise, years and years after the emergence of iTunes. Um, another heuristic that we often use is called the confirming evidence heuristic, whereby to act as a shortcut, we look for or even perceive only information that supports our views, our opinions, our ideas, and we actually screen out or discount disconfirming evidence, which is what we really need to critically evaluate our choices. Uh, another heuristic is called the availability heuristic, where our judgment is much too strongly affected by vivid or recent events, like say COVID-19, uh, leading to skewed perceptions of the world and poor estimation of risks or opportunities. Um, now, I did say you've probably actually heard of cognitive biases, but awareness doesn't mean that you can avoid them. Awareness doesn't mean you can even care because actually one of the things that system one thinking of is, it, it, system one thinking is very good at is, is observing contextual hints and cues like confirming evidence that we're doing the right thing to mislead us into actually overlooking our erroneous intuition. For example, it misleads us into thinking that we didn't actually face any other choices or the other options we faced were actually not obvious, so they were much too risky. In other words, we virtually never actually see these biases in action in ourselves. We might observe them in others if we know what to look for, but we never hardly ever really see them in ourselves, uh, even if we're aware that they exist with the result that although you may have known for years about these cognitive biases, um, you haven't really seen them as being much of a problem. So why get excited about eliminating something that doesn't look like a problem? You can't see it. Um, and our brains do all this because um, it's efficient. We are what these psychologists call cognitive misers. Um, the brain wants to take the shortest path possible. As I said, this isn't personal. I can say this with confidence because I know from knowing all about these, these concepts that I'm also a lazy cognitive miser riddled with cognitive biases who doesn't take sufficient care when I make decisions. So we're all in the same boat, really. Um, uh, they're probably the world's greatest expert on this is Daniel Kahneman, Nobel Prize winner. Um, he's a psychologist originally, although his Nobel Prize was for economics because his ideas he founded this whole area of study. His ideas led to the foundations of behavioral economics. He's, his his, his best-selling book that summarizes his life's work is called Thinking Fast and Slow, fast referring to system one and slow referring to system two. And he and all others in this field say that the best we can do to make better decisions is to revert to system two thinking, at least when it counts, to consciously try to go into system two thinking when it counts. So when does it count? When do we need this kind of reflective approach? Because by the way, we don't always need it. And it's not a good idea to try to make too many decisions on the basis of system two. For starters, we'd get paralysis by analysis. And there are some other problems I'll come to. Well, for starters though, um, system two should always be used if a decision is important. And what's important? Well, important in the sense, for example, that the achievement or non-achievement of the objectives really, really matters a lot to you. And it should usually be used if the decision is difficult. Now, not all difficult decisions are important. For example, what size packet of breakfast cereal might be a difficult decision to make if, for example, you were trying to get the best value, the most kilograms per euro, and the sign on the shelf that actually tells you in tiny print how many kilograms per euro is missing, and you're trying to work it out in your head. That might be difficult, but it's not very important. Or if you're in a restaurant, if you go back to a restaurant now that you can, if you go to a restaurant and they have your two favorite things on the menu, but you have to choose between them, that might be difficult, but it's not important because you love them both. Um, so sometimes a decision, however, might be important, but not apparently difficult, okay? Uh, because you might feel, well, this is an important decision, but the choice is obvious. I know what I should do here. 
In those decisions, I'd still advocate using system two because system one is very good at tricking us into thinking that the best choice is obvious, that the option is clear, um, and that we don't need to look for other alternatives. So that's why I say system two is always advisable if a decision is an important one. Um, it's worth, before we proceed, peeling back a layer and saying, well, what can make a decision challenging or difficult? What factors can make a decision difficult? Well, for starters, uncertainty is, uncertainty vexes us in many, many decisions. But in decisions where the stakes are high, uncertainty can really hold us back from making a choice because we know that if an event that's possibly outside our control um, conspires against us, we could have very bad outcomes. It's worth noting, therefore, that we can actually sometimes make good decisions that have bad outcomes. Conversely, you could make a bad decision. You could go with it on some crazy intuitive guesswork and you could just get lucky. That's the problem with uncertainty. The next problem is, uh, and where systematic approaches really help, probably most of all, is where we have complex decisions. Complexity can, cure, can come in a few varieties. One of the most common forms of complexity is where you have lots of choices. Also, we can have complexity where there are lots of choices, but the choices are not obvious. Furthermore, we can have complexity where we have linked sequential decisions, where a choice that we make now can influence the choices down the line. So for example, in company strategy, we can have situations in which, let's say our, our financial decisions now, such as capital allocation, can constrain us later. That can also happen in our personal finances. Or you could be deciding where to live, but at the same time, you might also be considering a move of job and the location that's good now might not be good later. A third type of difficulty in decisions is one where we have um, trade-offs, where we've got conflicting objectives uh, across the, the, the array of what we want to achieve. Um, we might want to, the house that's unfortunately uh, more expensive but in a great location or really the right size. Sometimes there's special kinds of conflicting objectives like that the higher the return, the greater the risk. We're not naturally good at making these decisions with system one thinking. In fact, frankly, we're terrible at it. Then there's one other kind of decision um, that really we could say system one is, is virtually designed for, that system one is ideal for, which is um, the small minor decisions that arise uh, in our lives on an almost, um, on an almost hourly basis. Um, and these decisions nonetheless can be, uh, can be difficult because of a phenomenon known as decision fatigue. So what's decision fatigue? Well, let me talk about it in the context of an example. Uh, maybe like many, many people, when lockdown came, you were at home, you may have been working from home or you may have been furloughed or you may have been somewhere in between the two. Now, you didn't have to spend as much time commuting. You possibly didn't have as many meetings or the meetings were shorter. In short, you might not have been doing as much, yet you might have found the whole process rather exhausting. And that's not just because of some general kind of stress, that's actually because of decision fatigue. System one thinking and its beauty is that um, it allows us to drift through our days without making choices. Almost all of what we do are habits or unconscious choices. But when our habits and our routines are broken, we have to make choices about all sorts of minor things. For example, you might have faced yourself having to make choices, more choices about groceries to buy, meals to eat, simple things like that, that you weren't really conscious of making as often or as much prior to lockdown. And so you start to suffer from decision fatigue. If you're gearing up to going back into the workplace now, you might go through another wave of this tiring process because you might find that the workplace is very different and the routines that you were able to settle into before don't necessarily, uh, aren't necessarily fit for purpose when you get back. So most of the time system one thinking is actually great, but it's not so good if we face uncertainty, complexity or conflicting objectives. Okay, so what I want to do now is highlight for you uh, some of the, the, the 
key elements of a systematic approach to decisions when you face an important, difficult decision. What would a systematic approach involve and why? What are the pitfalls that we can otherwise fall into and offer you some potential solutions? Well, a good systematic approach to decisions actually starts with a correct, adequate problem definition. That might sound obvious, but in a moment I'm going to show you why it's not so obvious at all. And then we should be clear about the objectives. We should be systematic and comprehensive in searching for alternatives, the options, the choices we could have. We need to deal with chance or uncertainty as I just described it. We need to tackle it rather than uh, freeze, procrastinate, or stab wildly at a guess. And when there are trade-offs, conflicting objectives, we should make them in a balanced way to make sure that our decisions are actually consistent with our own preferences. Okay, let me say um, a little bit more about the first steps. We'll take them together, problem definition and objective setting. So the pitfall here is that the problem with the way our brain works is system one, tends to be, not, not very actively, but taking in information from the environment. And when issues or problems start to emerge, tends to go straight through to identifying solutions, which may also be the most obvious thing or the first thing that comes up in the environment. So in other words, there's a tendency that we have to look for solutions without taking a step back and fully exploring, scoping out the problem. And um, the reason that that's problematic is that we then, in business, for example, we often will switch to a form of system two, like we might do some financial analysis or weigh up pros and cons. But the, the problem is that already we might be tackling the wrong problem at this stage, that our, our brains, without even realizing it, have focused in on a very narrow definition of the problem. That's the most common mistake that we make, a focusing problem, that we focus in too narrowly. And the more we analyze, the more we become convinced that this is the problem we need to solve. So let me give you an example. A pharmaceutical company was aware that, and not as an immediate problem, but as an issue they would face in their next round of major strategy making, uh, an issue that a round of strategy making that they'd go into for in about two or three years would be that about five or six years out from that point in time they were going to start to face serious capacity constraints at their main manufacturing facility. However, um, about five, six years before that capacity constraint was predicted to occur, an opportunity arose. A site adjacent to their main manufacturing facility became available for purchase. And they defined the problem then, as they, they, they conceived the problem as being, do we or don't we buy this site? They've already fallen into the fatal trap of inadequately defining the problem that they face. They're defining it as, do we or don't we buy this site? And it proved to be a huge dilemma that loomed over them for months and months and months. They did engage straight away in system two type analysis, rigorous financial analysis of the investment return if they bought this site, especially as over the course of the decision-making process and the bidding process, the price of the site went up and up and up, and they had to rework their analysis. Um, unfortunately, uh, because of the nature of the decision, um, you know, site purchases like this can be sensitive, so they kept the decision fairly confidential until the site was in the bag, and then they announced it across the entire group of companies. One of the other business units expressed incredulity that they'd made this decision, not simply because, like all of their other business units, their own potential for capital investment was now going to be hamstrung for years, but because they already owned a vast site where there was a disused warehouse that was being decommissioned and they were wondering what to do with it. The opportunity that had been missed because the decision problem had been incorrectly defined. Um, back in 2017, there was a fantastic HBR article, Harvard Business Review article about this, and 85% of the company surveyed in the article um, when the problem was described to, the, to, it, uh, to them, identified themselves as being bad at problem diagnosis in this way, and saying that they leap straight in 
to the solutions without adequately defining the problems. And so most people are doing this. Most companies are doing this. So what are the solutions? Well, it sounds straightforward. It sounds logical, but we must take a step back and define the problem before we seek solutions rather than assuming that we know what the problem is. Okay. Um, very often executives can feel almost reluctant or embarrassed to want to go through this step because we may feel I'm supposed to know and understand these problems. I don't want to look like an idiot to all these other guys, but it's always a good idea to step back and test, for example, is there a shared definition of the problem? Does everyone in the room think it's the same? In the example of the pharmaceutical company, the problem was never buy or don't buy. The problem was how to resolve your capacity constraint. Then identify the objectives that are to be met by prospective solutions, and you're ready to go forward to the next step, which is generating alternatives. And at this step, we'll see why, just why it's so important to uh, ensure that you've engaged in adequate problem definition. Because one of the most common pitfalls in organizational decisions and individual decisions is failure to generate a sufficient range of alternatives. Um, this is sometimes manifested in a behavior known as satisficing. Uh, those of you who've taken negotiation courses with me will have heard of this, but satisficing is a behavior in which we, we stop our search for alternatives once the alternative on the table is the adequate one rather than necessarily best. That's further compounded if we didn't define the problem in the first place. So not only do we have maybe a rather paltry set of alternatives, but they may be alternatives for solving the wrong problem, okay? So an appropriate problem definition is a very good start. Additionally, the generation of alternatives should always precede the evaluation. Time and again, we see decision processes where even the discussion of alternatives is blended with evaluation. An idea is, is floated and somebody says, yeah, but that wouldn't work because this or that wouldn't work because that. We actually need to train ourselves into separating idea generation from idea evaluation. Um, the thinking expert Edward de Bono knew this 40, 50 years ago when he invented the concept of brainstorming. He always insisted that brainstorming must occur before any evaluation of ideas and that during a brainstorming session, you should never critique or evaluate the ideas. In particular, a real danger point is to avoid framing decisions as binary go or no-go choices. Buy the site or don't buy the site is it's one of these binary go or no go choices. And it's a horrible way of fooling ourselves into thinking that we're making a decision when we're not really, because you've only generated one alternative to your existing situation, which is the site that's in front of you. Um, in such situations, um, all sorts of additional cognitive biases tend to arise. So you want to ensure you have at least two alternatives to your existing position. Now, it can really help to have a graphical or systematic tool for mapping your alternatives, for making sequential decisions, for looking at the uncertainties that you face. And decision trees are a great tool for doing this. So let's look, let's start with a simple example. Here's what the pharma company's binary go or no go decision would look like with a decision tree. So the square represents a choice and each branch represents a mutually exclusive option that you could follow. You either buy the site or you don't. But I already scratched this. I said, don't make decisions in this binary way. So if they sat down for even five minutes, they'd probably generate a few viable alternatives. If they extended the discussion into an open-ended discussion to generate lots of ideas, they might come up with a reasonable, a reasonable range of them. For example, the more obvious ones are to look for a couple of other sites that might fit their needs, even if they're not adjacent. Then we heard that they had this existing site where they could build on the old disused warehouse. And then, of course, another alternative is not to expand. Now, that's not quite the, say as, the same as don't buy, as we're about to see. Decision trees also enable you to start thinking about the sequential decisions you might make. For example, 
if they build on the other site that the company owns through a subsidiary, they might decide, well, let's operate two manufacturing facilities or we'll remove the entire operation. Not expanding doesn't necessarily mean not solving the problem. Remember, we started with a good problem definition. And if we're driven by our problem definition, when we're building decision trees, when we're figuring out what our options are, we're more likely to think of further alternatives. So here we think, if we don't expand, how can we further solve our capacity problem? Two ideas that might be generated initially would be, well, we could actually increase pricing, thereby reducing demand, but still making a ton of money. Or perhaps we could meet demand by outsourcing our manufacturing. Okay, I'm just going to take a question um, that's uh, come up here from Manny. Uh, that is, uh, how can we take decisions when we're shaped by various vested interests in a corporate situation? In other words, consciously remove bias in our decision making. Okay, I'm actually going to come back to that a bit later because once I've looked through these, let's say, uh, systematic steps that we can take in our own decisions, I'm going to talk about how we can apply these in an organizational context. Now, the next issue we face is we've dealt with problems, objectives, and alternatives is uncertainty. Okay. Now, the, um, the pitfall, the key pitfall in dealing with uncertainty is obviously we don't know what's going to happen. We face some kind of chance event outcome or some consequences that we just don't know. And this can lead us to either act too late or often, unfortunately, too soon. We may take steps that are premature, that we take prior to really uh, knowing enough about what's going to happen. So sometimes we can have the luxury of affording to wait until an uncertainty is resolved, or at least until there's better, clearer information. Um, Another trap that we tend to fall into, and this can particularly happen when we think we're being analytical, is that we assume away the uncertainty. We take a single point estimate. And this is in part because of a cognitive biases, bias known as anchoring. We can get anchored by that center point. So for example, in a procurement process, perhaps at the end of the process, um, the, the winning tender has given a price estimate for, let's say, building that building or that road, but indicates the risks involved. And we may know from our prior experience that these projects don't necessarily come in on price, but we fall into the trap of assuming that that single point estimate is what will happen. Now, how can we deal with the problem of uncertainty? Well, one way in which it can be dealt with to a reasonable degree, especially this is often used in project management, is best case, worst case, and most likely scenario analysis. Identifying more than one scenario can keep people awake to the possibility that we may not necessarily hit the most likely case. We do need to be careful with this though. It can be problematic, it can be misused. For example, organizational pressures can lead to unreasonable and unwise attempts to assume that the best case can sometimes, uh, should, be, should be made and that we play a blame game if it's not. A better approach than scenario analysis, if you face a really important decision where almost the whole decision hinges on an uncertainty and its outcomes, is to assess the full range of possibilities and estimate their likelihood. Okay, we'll look at actually a simple example in just a moment. Um, moreover, generally what I would urge is to take on a mindset, a mindset in which any time we make decisions, we recognize that we recognize the uncertainty that exists and we recognize that we can't always eliminate it. It's there. So we're conscious of a range of outcomes. And if some of the uncertainty is within our control, then we take risk management actions to try and narrow that range of actions down. One of the subjects I teach in the business school is actually project risk management. And project risk management is all about actually recognizing the range of risk and then looking at the actions that can be taken to limit its effects, to mitigate it. Okay, so how can we factor uncertainty into a decision? Let's like take an example. So this is a much simpler, uh, smaller scale example than the pharmaceutical company faced. Um, a, uh, 
a barista has decided to go out on her own, set up her own little coffee shop, and her dilemma is which coffee making machine to buy. And she faces two options. She can buy the CM50 or the CM75. The first one is lower capacity. The second one can churn out a lot more cups of coffee in the same time. By the way, I don't want you to mistake this for one of those binary go or no go decisions. Here, she has two alternatives, not one, to the status quo. It's all right to have just two options, as long as it's not just a simple go or no go choice. Now, she wants to think about uncertainty, and the uncertainty that she faces is what demand is she going to have in her coffee shop? If she buys the small machine, she's gonna save herself a lot of money, and that might be fine if demand remains low and within the capacity levels of the machine, but it could be a problem if demand is high. So she makes some assessment of what she believes her demand will be, perhaps based on her experience of having worked in coffee shops. So she thinks that in the first year, there's say a 50% chance that she'll get between 50 and 30 customers per hour, and a 50% chance she might get 30 to 45 customers per hour, right? Then she thinks through to what could happen the next year. By the way, we could make a more complex, uh, nuanced assessment of the, of the demand scenario. So what I've shown here is she could break it into, let's say, four possible options. And we see that in these decision trees that the chance event, the uncertainty, is represented by a little circle representing that you can't control what's going to happen. Now, there's a range of ways in which you could depict this. I generally recommend if you're trying to sketch out a decision tree for your problem, it's best to keep the representation as simple as possible at first, even oversimplified, and later you can refine it, or you end up with too much of a mess on your hands. So she stuck with this similar, this, this similar kind of representation for her year two demand, in which she's indicating that if demand is low in year one, it might stay the same in year two or go up to 30 to 45 per hour. And if it's high in year one, if it's 30 to 45 customers per hour, it might stay the same in year two or it might further go up. So now she's represented the uncertainty that she faces uh, in her dilemma. She's starting to get to grips with it and she can identify the specific chance event that she's concerned about that specifically if she buys the smaller coffee, the smaller capacity coffee maker, she might actually not be able to keep up with all the demand. There could be a lost opportunity here and she wouldn't be as profitable as she'd otherwise be. Now, one of the benefits of doing this kind of decision analysis is that it can promote new insights into your decision. Now that she's had this new insight into what could happen if demand is high in year one and it improves further in year two, she can start to think of sequential choices she can make. Like here, she could now, right at this point, right at the starting point, she could think ahead to the end of year one and say, well, at the end of year one, if demand has been good, maybe the company I buy the machine from could get me a second one, or better still, maybe I could discuss with them whether there's an option to swap out the old one for a new one. I wonder if they'll do that for me. And so then she'd be able to take uh, advantage of either uh, a continued or a rising demand scenario. So the overall benefit here of decision trees that's illustrated in this example is that it's not just about uh, complicating the process, it's about slowing down your thinking to promote insight. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of mastery to do this, to use this technique, but it's very helpful and you can take these decision trees further. If you really like numerical analysis, then when you're happy that you've got the structure of your decision tree right, you can actually put in the potential consequences at every end point, analyze backwards and systematically work out what's the best uh, option. But for me really, probably the most useful insight from decision trees is to recognize um, when is the, uh, when is the, um, their, their new insight coming into the process. And actually in corporate situations, in answer to the, a question that Manny asked earlier in the chat, in corporate situations using decision trees can actually help the, the whole team to look more clearly at what exactly are we, are we doing here? What exactly are we, are we looking at? And for everyone to generate new ideas. Um,
Now, um, Caroline has thrown in a question here saying that it's common for members of senior management to have different agendas, which can present a problem to the decision maker as they gain agreement to a decision, only to find that someone else disagrees. So we're gonna come back to that as well in a few minutes when we look at some of the, the other problems that can arise in these, um, in these group organizational decision-making situations. Um, there is one more pitfall and, and, and solution set I want to offer you though, which is what to do when we deal with, uh, with when we face trade-offs between our conflicting objectives. Well, the problem is we're not naturally good at balancing the conflict between objectives. Um, either we tend to ignore or downplay certain objectives or we bump up one or the other and, um, and uh, we don't search for enough alternatives that might meet both, both. So our system one thinking in particular tends to focus our intention on what's most obvious or most recent or most exciting. So imagine some house hunters walking into a house, uh, maybe the 10th or 20th or 30th house that they viewed, they go in and they see this beautiful sunlit kitchen uh, and streaming light coming in from a flower filled garden that leads down to a lovely fence. System one thinking draws your attention to the positive attributes. But unfortunately, it won't tell you that behind that fence there's a stream or an underground stream, the house is in a floodplain and you'll never be able to get insurance. Okay, so how can we deal with the trade-offs when conflicting objectives do arise? Well, for starters, if we're making decisions in a systematic way, remember, in line with problem identification, we should also identify all our objectives. And when we've identified all our objectives, we should make sure that when we've weighed up, when we've mapped out what our choices are and what our uncertainties are, we identify the consequences for each objective. So for example, um, a job hunter who let's say wants to have a, an exciting, fulfilling job, but also minimize commuting time and, and business travel time or something like that uh, and maximize salary would systematically identify the, uh, the job satisfaction, commuting time, salary, and so on, each objective in each possible option faced. There are two particular kind of trade-offs uh, that can especially throw us. We need to be extra careful when we face choices that have short-term and long-term costs or gains. Often there's a trade-off between these things. The bias in particular we need to be aware of is something called hyperbolic discounting. Uh, this is where, for example, we hugely overweight immediate consumption versus long-term savings. Or in a more mundane example, it's the temptation to give in to a desire for unhealthy snacking versus the long-term desire to eat healthily. Decisions that involve risk versus return are also a particular temptation and we need to factor in our attitude to risk. Overall, a systematic approach to each of these steps, problem identification and objective setting, alternative generation, assessing uncertainty, and weighing up the trade-offs, will help us in important decisions. But as some of the questions have already identified, new challenges start to creep in if you're making decisions in an organizational setting. For starters, um, before we even consider all those political considerations, we have a more complex set of inputs and evaluation. The decision-making can be distant from the action. The decisions have to be implemented by other people who did not make those choices. And then, uh, that some of the questions I've read out have pointed to, we have the potential for dysfunctional conflict, silo thinking, infighting. So what I want to do now uh, for the final 10-15 minutes or so of this webinar before we take some open up to more questions is give you a few concise suggestions uh, and uh, health checks you can apply to the decision process in your organization. Well a good starting point is to consider we've talked about well you know, what an, an individual's decision process can look like if it's if it's really effective. What does an effective organizational decision process look like? Well, for starters, 
your decision process should always generate at least two options. And remember, the binary go or no go doesn't count as two because there's only really one alternative to the status quo. Next, assumptions are tested. And that means that when, if they're facts, they really are facts. You've identified them rigorously. They're not just asserted or assumed. That's one of the problems that underpins um, a lot of this organizational conflict, that one person's facts are very different to another person's facts because there isn't some grounds for, uh, for testing those facts. Um, and this leads us to the next criteria for an effective decision process, which is we should have clear, well-defined criteria. We should know what is a good decision for us. And that means the decision should be consistent with goals. So can you look at your organization's decisions and say all the decisions made around here are very consistent with a clear shared set of goals? Earlier on, during the midst of our lockdown, generally speaking, public opinion here seemed to be that um, while lockdown was difficult, that our government was making decisions that were consistent with goals. Um, not just here, but internationally, the British government was criticized and ridiculed for inconsistent, unclear decision making and recommendation and advice. Now, I think there's more debate here about our decisions being consistent as we're reopening, of course. We can see in organizations the value and importance of decision criteria being well-defined and clearly understood. We also need to encourage to foster dissent and debate. Rather than run away from it or try and mask it, the secret to solving it is to have an effective process for dealing with this and to ensure that decisions are perceived to be fair. This deals with these organizational politics and conflict problems because we could say that the essence of organizations is that they're interpersonal and the essence of organizational decision making is that it's an interpersonal process. If you go back up this list from the bottom, you could say that's obvious with the, the, first, the, the bottom two points, the, the fairness and the need for dissent and debate. But it's also a, an implicit element in having well-defined decision criteria. We have to have some shared idea of what those criteria are, a shared agreement of the assumptions, and indeed uh, some involvement in the generation of alternatives. So a healthy organization decision process is one that actually promotes healthy conflict. I see there's a couple more comments and questions that have, have uh, come in here now. Uh, I'm going to jump to, um, Jump to a couple of them here. Um, so Maria Keeney has asked, um, we often hear about organizations doing their due diligence, but what percentage of leaders do you think are going with their gut on individual difficult decisions rather than a systematic approach? Um, my answer would be 100%, that all of us do this, but what good leaders do, and I can't tell you what percentage that is, what good leaders do is they do actually have a systematic approach, okay? Um, now, John Donahue has uh, thrown in a question. Uh, Hi, Stephen, how do you think, uh, how do you think or believe that some people have better performing or higher quality system one, in other words, intuitive processes? And if so, what's the advantage based on? Um, this, uh, this idea was popularized some years ago by uh, the writer Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell in his book Blink. Well, John, unfortunately, all of the other authors in this area, or virtually all of them, certainly Daniel Kahneman and all of his camp, completely trash this idea. The idea that there are among us some superpower geniuses whose intuition is so, so sharp that they don't really need to think that they perform even better when they just rely solely on their intuition. Now, that kind of process serves certain situations well. It will serve a soccer player well if they don't think, if they've trained their instincts through thousands and thousands of hours of training, or a Formula One racing driver, for example. But the kind of decisions in organizations are not like that at all. We should be able to reflect on 
the problem identification, the objectives, the alternatives, and so on. They're not like those instant, quick, and often reversible decisions. Um, okay, um, let's uh, now look at, well, what, was, what will a healthy conflict process look like? Well, an unhealthy process, well, let, let's take it from the start of, right from when a proposal is generated through to the outcome of that. So let's say the life cycle of a decision. Right from the start in an unhealthy process, the proposals that are being generated will tend to be biased. They will come from an individual or a function or a team. So they'll tend to be biased towards function or team fiefdoms. A healthy process will promote diverse viewpoints, either a collaborative process or cross-functional ones with openness to each other's functions or teams. What will, happen in, what will happen in the unhealthy process with the analysis is that the benefits get exaggerated and the risks ignored or understated. Whereas in a healthy process, because there's less of this fiefdom mentality, the analysis will be more systematic and geared towards honest appraisal. When the proposal has to be debated or discussed, that debate will be quite vehement and often personalized or politicized if the conflict process is, un is unhealthy, whereas it should be a debate of dialogue and reason in a healthy process. When it comes to the decision, you can see that if you've got an unhealthy conflict process, your decision is already fatally wounded. You haven't generated enough ideas and they haven't been adequately evaluated. It's very, very difficult for senior decision makers to actually know whether they're making a decision that's based on solid analysis or not, if there isn't a healthy conflict process and decision process underpinning those decisions. Whereas the decision making will lead to the best ideas if there's been a collaborative development process. The outcome will be collective ownership and committed implementation rather than there being winners and losers. And this is where there's a huge problem as well because in that unhealthy process, even the winners can be losers because the person who gets their way may not get their decision well implemented if the process is not one that's led to commitment and committed implementation is required uh, for almost all important organizational decisions. If you make strategy decisions, there are some specific criteria that you should be aware of. Um, Kathy Eisenhardt is an acknowledged expert on this area. She's done a lot of research on what are the decision-making processes in the most effective strategy-making teams and what happens in ineffective teams. Well, for starters, she says that the teams themselves are different, that the most effective teams tend to work with a lot of interaction and information sharing, whereas the least effective ones behave almost like strangers cross-functional sharing of decision-making processes, information or analysis is relatively rare. So in other words, the effective strategic decision-makers act very collectively. They also tend to stimulate conflict. So you can see that that's an important process of that collective thinking approach. Um, whereas what tends to happen in ineffective processes is conflict is dysfunctional. Either there's all a war, simmering rivalry, or conflict is suppressed. I've often seen that in teams of, uh, in teams of senior managers who come into workshops, that they, they claim that there's no conflict. And I get worried when they say this. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that in effective strategic decision-making teams, the decisions are very passive, pacey and energetic. Even major strategy decisions, like new company direction, uh, complete organization restructuring, takeovers and so on, uh, they're made in a very pacey two to four months. What tends to happen in organizations that have poor decision processes is that strategic decisions are long and drawn out, they're agonized over, the rarity of them, the risks involved are all stressed, and it sometimes appears like the decision will never be made. A good decision-making process also diffuses the politics. So while conflict is stimulated, the culture is collaborative and a positive mood is maintained. Whereas conflict may be suppressed in an ineffective process, but politics actually ultimately influences the decision. 
So I'm going to wrap up. Before we look at some more of the questions that have arisen, I'm going to wrap up with um, just a few questions uh, for your organization. Um, is there a defined systematic decision-making process? Uh, this is a real warning sign. If you can't define the decision-making process, the steps that the organization goes through any time or your team goes through any time a key decision is made, you should be able to. How is conflict manifested and managed in your decision-making process? Does it look more like the healthy or the unhealthy process that I just described? When a decision is made, do employees understand it? Do they take ownership? Do they commit wholeheartedly? Or is there grumbling or complaint that it's not consistent? Is there even a lack of commitment? And finally, when it comes to major strategic choices in your organization, is it a fast decision process that delivers effective results or is it agonized over and is it politicized or involving dysfunctional conflict? Okay. Um, I am going to now look and see, I'm going to open my chat box here again and see what other questions have, uh, have come up. Um, so let's see, one of the questions is from Carl Purcell. Um, can you comment on how organizations can use super forecasting techniques promoted by Tetlock to improve decision making? Well, I'm not specifically familiar with, uh, with uh, Tetlock, uh, but in forecasting in general, one of the things that the most effective organizations do, actually with reference to Kathy Eisenhardt's work, is that because they have this, this uh, decision process of, of what we just described as being um, the, uh, the, the collective intuition, all parts of the organization are, in particular of the senior team, are collaborating regularly and often so it's just more likely that information gets bubbled up to key decision makers and made decisions get made in real time. Um, Manny has asked, uh, four of five leaders who managed the COVID-19 situation were women. Do women by nature make better decisions? I think what this decision is referring, what this question is referring to is the fact that um, some of the, the most praised nations, like for example, uh, New Zealand and Denmark, praised for their handling of, of, um, of COVID-19, have uh, female leaders. Um, in short, um, I'm afraid, without wanting to take any flack here, the answer is no. There's no evidence that women are somehow immune from cognitive biases or make better or worse decisions than men. We're all in this. So those critiques of decision-making uh, apply to all of us, but perhaps uh, in those countries they've established better decision-making processes. Um, the uh, next question that's come up is, what do you do if you work in a company which has a culture that fosters an unhealthy decision-making process? Okay, how do you nav navigate this? Well, for starters, I'd say um, change starts here as we as as our one of our catchphrases is our slogan um so change starts with you and how you make decisions in in your team um, also when you're if you're involved in promoting or advocating a decision to uh senior levels in the organization you can go through a systematic process of generating alternatives and identifying the criteria that should be met by the uh, by the decision. Um, there's a specific question about decision trees that I, I want to come back to. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, actually, maybe this is a, a linked question. The specific question that came up a bit earlier from Eamon was, how do you use decision trees for making a decision on bidding into an auction? And then uh, Patrick has asked, my company, when deciding to bid or tender for a new job, funnel a number of factors down to essentially a go or no go decision to bid or not. Is this a flawed system? Okay, so my recommendation for a bidding decision, if it's a major decision and you feel we should take a step back here, we should do some analysis before we decide, whether you're bidding at an auction or deciding whether to bid for a new job, is to look at all the options available to you. Now, in an auction situation, unfortunately the nature of it is at first, it appears to be a go or no go. So I would always recommend identify some alternative. 
What will you do if you don't buy at the auction? That's one of the fundamental things that leads people to overbid at auctions if they neglect their alternative. In negotiation, we call that alternative your BATNA, your best alternative to negotiated agreement. We could say here, it's your best alternative to winning at the auction. You're more likely to become uh, prey to the winner's curse, being the person who bids so high at the auction that to win is actually to lose. If you haven't identified a range of alternatives that you could take, such as later options or even parallel options now. Um, so for Patrick's question, um, and by the way, you can map all that out relatively easily as a decision tree. In the Diploma in Advanced Management Performance, there's now a new mod module that we added uh, relatively recently in which we spend a day looking at some of these techniques. We build them out, we look at how to build decision trees and do other forms of analysis to make more systematic decisions. Um, Patrick has asked here, his company, when deciding to bid or tender for a new job, funnel, funnel, funnel a number of factors down to essentially a go or no-go decision to bid or not. Is this a flawed system? I would say if it's genuinely a go or no-go decision, then it is a flawed system. However, if the no-go is always represented by having weighed up the other alternatives you face, and you've weighed up those alternatives against the same criteria, such as, well, if we don't bid or, or go for this job, if we don't take that job, we'll go for the following ones later in the year, or we'll take this instead, or we'll expand this product line or this line of service, then that's okay. But when we make decisions as go or no-go, the problem is we start to perceive the no-go very often as, as highly risky, as actually a losing scenario. And we overweight the go. In fact, very often people frame decisions as go or no-go in the first place because system one has already set their hearts on the go. And the whole supposed analysis process is just a charade we put ourselves through to try and justify that. Um, I'll take uh, one, more, uh, one more question that's come up here in the chat is, are there types of business decisions that are better suited to female or male biases? Well, um, to my knowledge, there aren't cognitive biases that have been identified as exclusively female biases or exclusively male biases. However, some evidence in, in the area of negotiation and conflict indicates that um, many women feel better capable of managing conflict situations than, than many men. This is, by the way, uh, not the case with all women or all men, okay? And bear in mind, skills for conflict management can be learned. It's not some kind of set in stone personality or gender-based fait accompli. But if, for example, uh, a decision maker, let's say a male decision maker, sees the decision process as somehow being a battle in which our team or our function must win and the others must lose, and a female decision maker sees it as being, this is a collaborative process in which the best decision should be made, then I would say the woman is more likely to make a better decision. But to me, that choice or that perception isn't really a, a simply gender-based thing. There are many, many female business leaders who would um, perceive those decisions as fiefdom-based conflicts. And there are many men, I would hope, who would see those decisions as needing a collaborative input and needing to be looked at from every angle. Okay, um, I want to pass you over to uh, my colleague uh, Maria again now. Thanks very much. Thank you, Stephen, um, and a lot of interesting questions there. I, I, it just left me for, to finally say to you all, um, for those of you who don't know, we're back on campus in September, and um, so we're really looking for, forward to seeing some of you face to face. And uh, we've, um, we've been delighted by the interest in our, both our diploma programs and short courses in fact, uh, Stephen's program, the Diploma in Advanced Management Performance in the autumn is already full, but we will be running it again in the spring. So please do get in contact with me if, you, if you'd like to be added to the list. Um, Stephen also runs um, a, a different subject matter, the Winning Negotiations Short Course, uh, 
which is starting on the 1st of October. Um, so again, please do get in contact with me if you're interested in those or any of the, uh, our other programs. I will be sending out an email to all of you afterwards um, with the recording of the webinar for you to look back on or if you'd like to share it with colleagues, we, we'd be delighted for you to share it on. Um, and I'll include a full list of all our programs. So again, if you're interested, just to avoid disappointment, please get back in touch with me. Um, I suppose just finally to say thank you so much to, for, to Stephen. That was a really informative and um, engaging webinar. I can see from all the questions um, um, coming in on the, the chat that you all enjoyed it yourself. So thank you to Stephen and um, thank you to all of you for joining us and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye.